Hi, and welcome to a new video. In this video, we will talk about how a mechanical watch is adjusted and regulated, and I will also tell you how you can do that yourself. First, I want to give you a little disclaimer. Don't expect to be able to work like an expert. I'm not an expert, and be prepared to learn, make mistakes, and damage stuff. See it as a hobby and do it with cheap movements and watches, and you are responsible for what you do with your watches. So first of all, how does the regulation of a watch work? If we look at the watch, the obvious thing is the balance and the balance spring. This is the part of the watch that makes it run and is responsible for its accuracy. In order to be able to understand it, we really have to understand two things. One is the bead error and the other thing is the active length of the hairspring. The bead error has to do with the angle at which the jewel at the bottom of the balance wheel engages with the lever from the escapement and basically explains the difference between the tick and the tuck. And both those oscillations should in theory be perfectly similar. We know the bead error from a time grapher where it is displayed in milliseconds. And that means basically that the difference between the bead to the left and the bead to the right from the balance wheel and the hairspring is ever so slightly different, either in 0.8 or 0.9 or 1.8 or 2.8 milliseconds, and that's really what the bead error displays. But what is more important is how the bead error is adjusted, and in most modern watches it is one of those two small studs that you can see here, and we will talk about that in a second. The other thing to understand is the active length of the hairspring, because that's really what governs the accuracy of a mechanical watch. In wristwatches and pocket watches, we cannot work with gravity, because the watch is in movement all the time. So we invented the hairspring, and the hairspring basically is sort of a artificial gravity. And the principle is, the longer the active length of that little hairspring, the slower the watch runs, and the shorter the active length of that hairspring, the faster the watch runs. So in most mechanical watches, the accuracy and precision of the movement is defined by the active length of the hairspring. And changing the active length of the hairspring with a small tool is how you regulate a watch. There are also other ways, but in most vintage watches and most traditional watches and even most relatively inexpensive watches today, the watch is regulated by adjusting the active length of the hairspring. If we look at a movement like this, we have two studs who are above the balance. In traditional watches, the stud that holds the hair spring, which is for the bead error, is usually fixed to the movement. On modern watches, like you see here, both of these little studs are movable, which means that the bead error can be adjusted, and also the active length of the hair spring can be adjusted. If you want to adjust your watch, you always start with the bead error. If the bead error is off, adjust the bead error until it's acceptable for you so that you don't want to change it anymore. Because if you change the bead error, you automatically also change the active length of the hairspring. If you've set your bead error to 0.0, .0 or whatever you can achieve, then you can go to the second stud, which usually also has this long indicator, which indicates on a scale on the back of the balance bridge in which direction the watch goes faster and in which direction it goes slower. First of all, we have to make sure that the watch is not magnetized. And you first have to demagnetize it before you can actually adjust it, because adjusting a magnetized watch basically does nothing. You also have to make sure that the watch is fully wound, because the readings on a time grapher will only be precise if the watch is fully wound, because typically with less and less power in the main barrel, the watch will get slower and slower and ha have a little bit more variation in its accuracy. You should also make sure that the date setting or other mechanisms in the watch are not engaged. So a chronograph function should not be engaged. It also should not be late at night so that the date mechanism is already engaged because this will drain power from the mainspring and obscure the reading on the time grapher and therefore your adjustment will not be precise because once the movement is out of the date setting phase, your regulation will just be off. If a watch is clean and without flaws, the bead error and the rate should roughly be the same in all positions. Some deviation is acceptable and has to do with friction and different orientations of the movement, and higher deviations between positions indicate that the watch possibly needs a service. And my recommendation is that it doesn't make sense to regulate a watch that really should see a service. 
If you do the regulation yourself, don't expect to adjust the watch to chronometer standards. With most watches, if you are in a window of actually running 10 to 15 seconds a day, plus or minus, you're really doing pretty well. Also, the adjustment on the time grapher and wearing the watch in real life is not really the same thing. It is totally possible that on the time grapher you have the watch to the perfect zero seconds a day, and then you wear it and then it's 20 seconds off. It is a breathing mechanism on your wrist and you're moving it the entire day. So be realistic in your expectations. So how do we actually do this? Well, first of all, we adjust the beat error in small increments. And you can see that here. You can just put it into one direction and then wait for the changing result on the time grapher. And if the number gets higher, you know that you're essentially adjusting it into the wrong direction. So you just then go into the opposite direction and you really carefully and slowly over time get closer to 0, 0.0 or whatever you can achieve. In my opinion, a range from 0.0, .0 milliseconds to roughly 0 0.8, 0 0.9 milliseconds is acceptable in my view. If you're dealing with vintage watches where the hairspring is fixed to the balance bridge in a way that you can't change the beat error, you can change it by completely removing the balance assembly and then manually changing it at the bottom of the balance wheel. But this is really something that is not recommended for people who have never worked on a watch because you're literally working on the heart of a watch at this point. So if you have a pocket watch that is at 1.3, just leave it at 1.3. If we're done with the beat error, we can take care of the actual adjustment. And it's the same thing here. We can use this little lever and on the back end and move it a tiny bit and then see what changes that actually does in the watch. And that way we can slowly get to a more precise reading. We sometimes can restart the machine and sometimes change the orientation of the watch to get an idea on how much it changes. And typically if the watch is flat on its dial side or flat on its movement side, that's where the least friction is in the movement. So don't be surprised if you turn the watch over to the side when all of the pivots rest in sort of all of their bearings that then the watch suddenly runs a couple of seconds slower. Usually in that orientation also the amplitude drops a little bit. I will probably do another video that shows the process in more detail so that you can replicate it much more for yourself, but this is how generally a watch is regulated. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Like and subscribe if you don't want to miss out on new videos in the future. And you can also follow me on Instagram for more content. You find the link for Instagram in the video description. If you have any watchmaking related questions or if you have any ideas for future videos, feel free to comment them in the comment section down below. Thank you and I hope to see you in the next video again.